good evening everyone and welcome to another edition of the Weekend Wrap brought to you by Crowcast of course and just for everyone's benefit I've already unmuted my <laughs> my cohort so uh, without further ado, <laughs> Maka how are you going mate? Yeah very good thanks. No, very good and Nick how are you doing? I'm going very well. Uh, and we have a, a special guest just for a moment uh, at the beginning tonight uh, saying hello to our new sponsor, Ryan, from Smith Partners Real Estate. How are you going, Ryan? Uh, yeah, re- really well, thank you, mate. Um, and uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And a successful weekend for you, mate? Uh, yeah, it was, actually. Yeah, we had uh, we actually had really good numbers um, over the weekend. And um, considering we're so close to election, it's, um, it's ticking along okay. So yeah, good. elections are usually... Uh, Property sales killers, aren't they? <laughs> uh, yes, it, it seems that people yeah, do put their hands in their pocket over over that sort of period, but no, it's, it's going okay. Look, to everyone uh, listening, uh, we just thought we'd have Ryan on quickly as he has become a major supporter of the Crowcast, for which we're very grateful. So, mate, uh, I just thought I'd give you a couple of minutes just to maybe explain your interest in the Crows and why you're... Uh, apart from me badgering you all the time, why you've decided to align yourself with, with our lovely podcast? Um, I've tried to be Switzerland from a business point of view with Port and um, and, and the Crows, but uh, yes, I've always been a massive... Well, actually, that's a fib. I was actually a Hawthorne supporter um, back in the day, but um, uh, ever since the Crows came in in that first game um, that we played, um, obviously, yeah, as a South Australian, a proud South Australian, we jumped on board there. Um, I don't know if it was the right move. I think it's the right move, but geez, there's a bit of, bit of pain over the last few years with with Hawthorne, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah always, always support locals. So, um, yeah, and um, yeah, for the people out there, uh, Rob and I do go a long way back. We worked back in finance. I don't dare to guess how long ago. About 150,000 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be about What's that. that our sponsorship amount? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah, right. Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, um, maybe so, we should um, make it, yeah. you know, a, a, a grand for every year since we last worked together, Ryan. <laughs> that, that, perfect. Well, that sounds half the price that I'm paying, isn't it? Yeah, that, 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 pretty that's much. Good. No, yeah. no, all good. So, um, no, yeah, I, I mean, I love my sport, and we, uh, we're we big in the community. We're, we're, our office is based out in the northeast, but um, Adelaide's a small place. We grew up in the Adelaide Hills, um, and, uh, yeah, working for, what, two and two for eight years, and a couple at Ray White, and my wife and I started our, our business about, oh, a bit over five years ago, so... Um, yeah, we're big on the community. We 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 yeah, big um, partners. We're major sponsors of the Mobbery Jets out here in the northeast, um, and also the Teacher Gully Tennis Club. Um, it's all about putting it back into the community. So about time I start putting back into um, into the teams that I'm you know really really passionate about as well. So um, yeah, just just proud to be part of it. No, look, we really appreciate it, Ryan. Now, and the other thing I think too, because of your uh, community spirit, and you are involved in a lot of stuff up there around the. Uh, Golden Grove and surrounding areas. Uh, you know, there's yes. ho- hopefully at some stage we'll be able to do something uh, for our listeners. That's a little bit of a, a, a joint uh, exercise to uh, to build the community around the Crowcast and uh, to get everyone together because that's what we're trying to build here with the podcast. Is a bit of a community of uh, people who bear it for the crows and are passionate about the crows. And uh, it's just uh, it's great to have you on board, mate. We really appreciate it. No, 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 no. I love the opportunity. So. Look forward to many, many years of, um, of yeah, of working together and um, bigger and better things. Now, Ryan gave me a cap on Friday when I was out there, and I looked terrible in caps. So, uh, <laughs> with your permission, Brian, we will be at uh, Ryan. Brian, Ryan, we will be. I uh, most things, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we will be uh, giving that away as a prize uh, over the next uh, week or so, just to uh, just to you know keep the bloody listeners happy. Nah, easy. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> All right, mate. Well, you're uh, you're about to crack in some food down at the uh, down at uh, where are you? The where Fox are the, and Fur, you're at the Fox at Fox and Firk, and yeah, um, Mother's Day, um, taking the big boss out, um, yeah, and um, and her uh, her sister and the family and the kids. So um, yeah, um, I've always wanted to come here, and yeah, here now. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's a nice little place, but uh, yes, that's what I'm about to do. But yeah. Um, Enjoy else. your yeah, tucker, yeah. right? Hopefully, I'll be part of it. Oh, thank you, mate. I mean, it looks it looks amazing. I I probably don't need a feed, but um, <laughs> I, I will anyway. And um, yeah, so it'll be good. Yeah, it's it's a nice night. So, like I say to everyone out there, um, yeah, especially on Mother's Day. Hopefully, everyone's had a, a wonderful day, and all the mums have, have been spoiled. Um, I've done my best. I've made pancakes. Now, apparently, I'm on pancake duty forever. Um, uh, so you did as, it too well, as, mate. As, as, 
I did it, bloody kids. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll try. I'll try and fail a bit next year and, and, and give it back to her. But um, <laughs> no, no, no. Everyone's had a good day, so that's the main thing. Yeah. Now look, uh, that's uh, fantastic, mate. Give our best to uh, the lovely wife, and uh, all the best for your for your uh, evening and uh, for your sales Thank results you. over the weekend. We're wrapped to have you on board, mate, and uh, I'm sure that we'll be interacting a lot for the uh, for the course of the 2019 season. Absolute pleasure, and um, yeah, um, just quietly. Well, not even just quietly, because it's all crow supporters on the on this. So, um, geez, that was a relief to get through that last night. How I, good I was it? I think everyone in the north. <laughs> I think everyone in the I think everyone in the northeast heard me yelling from the backyard. <laughs> I had a few friends and family over, and um, I came out um, thinking, "Oh, what's all happened? How much?" And then, uh, yeah, one of my mates, Jay, was like, "Oh God, my, oh my God!" So anyway, we got over the line, we and, um, and you know what? It's good in the last this the last the last two to three weeks. It's good to see us starting to play the the brand that, that that we were a couple of years ago. So um, I'm excited. I'm I'm keeping it, you know, a, a lid on it. Yeah, but, keep the um, lid on it. It's good to see the the, conf- the confidence is building. So it's good. No, I'm excited. And mate, just quickly before you go, you're also involved uh, yeah. with Down to Earth Electrical, um, and yeah. uh, we've been lucky enough to have them on board <laughs> as well. So uh, yeah, yeah, new business venture for us. So um, anyone that um, needs their hands. Um, from electrical, um, air conditioning, or data, or solar, or basically anything in that that line, um, we would we would love love to help wherever we can. And it's not just the northeast, and that's the same with the real estate as well. Adelaide's a small place, so I feel everywhere from God down south because that's where I grew up in the Adelaide Hills and down around Flagstaff, we have before Park, and as far as northeast. Um, so yeah, whatever we can do to help, um, you know, um, the you know the family at Crocast, then yeah, we'd love to. Fantastic. Look, mate, go and have your right. feed. Uh, thanks very much for coming on. We will have plenty of That's chats throughout the year. And, uh, yeah, yeah, good on you, mate. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Have Enjoy a great night. Feed, See you, mate. Thank See you. Ryan. All right. Take care, guys. Good night. Bye. And, yeah, I hope people weren't uh, too uh, uh, put out by us having Ryan on because it, it's very important uh, to us in terms of the growth of the Crowcast and... Uh, already the support uh, that he's uh, provided has allowed me just to uh, ramp up one or two things and, uh, uh, you know, the goal is to to make this the... You know, it's not a self-serving thing. We just want everyone to have as much good coverage of the Crows as we possibly can, so that's what we're all about and his support uh, contributes to that, so we're very grateful. And it was really nice. There's guys in the, the, the chat. There was um, a couple of thank yous towards Ryan. Uh, that came from in there, so that was nice to nice to see. Yeah, and well, you know, I actually found it more interesting than donkeys competition times. So okay. <laughs> PJ Crows think we've sold out. <laughs> we're, easy, we're easy to buy out. Yeah, yeah, no, we yeah, have, we're cheap. We have, we have sold out, PJ. We, we're we're not ashamed to say it. <laughs> but look, uh, get around Smith Partners Real Estate up there at Golden Grove at the Village Shopping Centre up there at Golden Grove. And down to earth electrical anywhere you like. Whenever you've got some uh, issues surrounding your electrical, all the links and phone numbers and whatnot are on our website and on Facebook and on our casts and everywhere else. So uh, support the people that support us. And that's it for sponsors. Let's get into the game, shall we? <laughs> right, yeah. I reckon we we just gave him his money money's worth right there. I reckon. Uh, just a bit. Just before we get into the bloody uh, the showdown. Uh, sorry, the results. How, how about the heart palpitations halfway through the last quarter last night? Oh, as long as we got Talia nowhere. back on, I was going to be okay because it's all freaking Talia's fault. But it was very unexpected, wasn't it? Because we just looked like we were cruising and in control, and then uh, actually they they made the move of switching Dougal Howard up there, and uh, all of a sudden there was a Ford that was competitive, and then it, and then that yeah, game. Because he didn't have an opponent. Yeah, well, that well, was that's... the thing. I, I think everyone was missing the fact that um, him getting moved down there coincided with Tars coming off. And, it did. Uh, it did. You know, mm. that uh, and, amplified. And Tali, his... that should have been, I mean, that's actually Talia's fault because he should have actually brought it to the attention of the umpire so it becomes a blood rule and holds the game up when we're doing a kick out. Good point, Nicky. Oh, yeah, but he's still, oh, yeah, whatever. He, he did kind of do the right thing to get himself off as quickly as possible to be treated, but because of what happened and the way it got turned back over, it meant we didn't have that extra player in defence that we needed. Yeah, fair call, fair call. Anyway, look, let's get into the scores, shall we? Did I let that run a little? 
little bit long. I was just uh, head banging along with J Mac to that. Um, bloody hell! Again, second week in a row, I was heading to a massive result in my footy tips until today, and then crashed and burned. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we started off on Friday night with the Swans kicking me off with a five point win over Essen. A little bit controversial, and I'll ask you about Rampy in a minute. But uh, the Swans getting Cock up seventy seven seventy two in the end. Five points. Uh, so, what do you reckon? Well, the rules are rules. I mean, you know, he's not a monkey and he's not a, you know, out on a tree. He's a footballer playing on an oval. You're not allowed to uh, climb posts and shake posts. And uh, the umpire saw it. He warned him, uh, telling him, he said, get down, get down. Uh, but he really, if he could have let the law, he should have paid the free kick. Yeah, it should have been a free kick. That's one of those rules that you don't give a warning for um, no. because you can't because the post is already moving. You can't stop the post moving. That's um, – and I know when we were taught about that rule, it was that as soon as they do it, you pay it. And it's the same as um, the 50 we got um, last week that they're still kind of whinging about for Keith's first goal, which is if you kick the ball away once it's over the line, that's an automatic free. It's, you can't give a warning about those ones because they're outside the field of play. It's just a bizarre thing. I mean, the fact that the umpire saw it, that should be it. That, yeah. Like, free kick, end, end of story, you know. There's there's no argument about it. And whilst I'm not complaining because I would have been absolutely spewing uh, <laughs> had that cost me my tip, but the simple it, fact no, is it that... No, it did get... cost me my tip. Yeah, well, I don't care uh, about your tip. Well, apart from the fact that it was very bizarre, I have to compliment him on his post climbing skills. I don't reckon I could get up that high. Yeah. Anyway, it was pretty bizarre. Um, Saturday, uh, Carlton breaking their supporters' hearts again, going down to Collingwood after uh, being around the place for quite some time during that game. Collingwood getting up by 19 points in the end, 106 to 87. Uh, Dane, played... Swan, Dane Swan had a hilarious tweet about it. What did he say? Well, Nicky, share it. Um, he said he wanted to congratulate um, the Collingwood Football Club for their, their heart and their thinking of the, the football community <laughs> by allowing um, Gol- Carlton to get so close and actually making it an interesting game for everybody to watch. Look, in fairness to Carlton, they played some very, very good football in that game and uh, they have in all season had patches of good football. Um, this is probably the longest good a patch of good football. Um, you always felt that in the end they were going to get done, but um, uh, I just wish they didn't play quite as well as that because I want you know we want that number one draft pick, and at the moment they're in the right spot. No, they can play like that and still lose because yeah. it keeps Bolton in the job. <laughs> All right, we had uh, the other game on Saturday. We had um, the Western Bulldogs having a solid win over the Brisbane Lions, ninety-two to seventy-six. The Bullies getting up by sixteen points. Yeah, I didn't get to see that game. I think that that was probably as, as predicted, I think, because um, the Brisbane Lions have just tapered off a little bit, in my opinion. Um, and uh, Western Bulldogs, on the other hand, are just uh, not a resurgence, but they're playing a little bit better than they were. So I think that result was probably as expected, close, but uh, one to the bullies. It was interesting. The highlights I saw of the game were actually all Brisbane. <laughs> I'm like, but didn't they not win? Um, if, when I was looking at the tips this round, I went, we're playing Brisbane next week. I bet you they're going to get done. So it means they're going to have their tails up and going against us. Because I thought, yeah, the way this round's going to go, it's not going to be to our benefit at all. And now, yet Nikki, the tips have actually worked out very nicely for us. Now, Nikki, you're going to get a, a cable ban in a minute. I'm sorry, it's my it's my team's footy no, top. No excuses, no excuses, just take care of it. Um, where are we up to? Oh, bloody hell. The Suns and the that Demons. Was so I, oh. I picked the Suns, right? And so I'm cheering with a minute to go. Cheering with a minute to go. And then what the hell happened there? Anyway, uh, the D's getting up by a point in the end, 61 to 60 in what was a... F- Reason I watched bits and pieces of that game, and whilst it was a, a low-scoring game, it was uh, it was quite interesting to watch. And uh, uh, Stuart, you after uh, making the comment that uh, that last minute wouldn't have happened without the new six six six. So 
whilst it was exciting yep. to uh, for the fans, obviously, it was very, very difficult to coach against. Um, that being said, uh, they could have lined up a bit more defensively in the middle, I reckon. But anyway. That's, and I think that, you know, and that's a very good point you raised because that's where they lost it. Um, you know, with a minute to go, the obvious thing is to try and get the ball straight down at, at the feet of the Ruckman, um, which is it, I think, was the Ruckman. Yeah. Uh, and, and that should have been his sole goal, not not to try and jump up and hit it anywhere or anything. And I know he's got a job with Big Maxi, but that's whether he somehow to nullify it to get it down to the ground, because but it didn't happen that way. And once the ball's out in the open, that gave Melbourne the opportunity and they got that goal very quickly. And, and you, so I thought, geez, this is going to be a draw, but they still got down there again. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, never. the Swans did the right thing. They, that they Not the Swans, the Suns did the right thing and they got Martin back. Once they had that secondary little ball up, he quickly went back to become that um, loose man. But it meant that his player was loose out in the wing and where he positioned himself, he was too close to other Suns defenders. He actually needed to be that bit further over. Um, I had tipped Melbourne, but I was furiously barracking for the Suns when it was happening. As we all were, I think. Yeah. Uh, and PJ Crow's reporting that he's, uh, that um, Isaac Rankin's redone his hamstring. So he, he may not actually yep. play a game for the Suns before he gets traded back to Adelaide. Well, if he's going to keep doing his <laughs> hammy, then we want him. <laughs> well, depends how he's doing his hammy. He may not be doing his hemi. Uh, the Eagles are getting up over St Kilda, 88-70. to 70. I didn't watch this game. Anyone watch it? Um, nope. No, not that one. <laughs> I was too busy watching ours. Uh, and then today, bloody today, um, and it's getting worse too as I'm watching the scores here. Um, Geelong did the right thing, 104-80 to 80 over um, North Melbourne. Uh, Geelong getting up by 24 points and uh, Mr Ablett in a bit of trouble again. Seriously, he should have been in trouble last time, in my opinion, and I have no doubt if he'd been a, a Crows player last time, he would have got he would have served time. This one, I think, is even more blatant because he's done it front on, and he's and he has jumped and he put the elbow straight into the guy's face. Now, yeah. I I don't care how you classify it, but he has to go. I mean, seriously, you cannot do that. You just can't do it. Um, they also Fife might be in trouble as well. He did a raised elbow. Yeah, I saw that. I think well, he's got he's got a little bit more chance than Ablett, I think. But uh, I mean, they should both go. But um, well, Ablett now I, two I mean, weeks in a row, and the elbow's bad enough, Macker, as you know. It's probably the most dangerous weapon that you have uh, on a footy field. But once you jump in the air, that shows intent. And to my way of thinking, he's got to go for two weeks. I I hundred percent agree. One's not good enough. It has to be two. Uh, and then the Giants not turning up against Hawthorne. Uh, I don't know. I didn't watch this game, but what the hell happened? Hawthorne they're more, getting up 71 they're to 38. more allergic to the MCG than we are. Oh, seriously, they, well, Nicky, that's a very good point. Um, uh, I put my tips in and I read afterwards that they've only run what, one, once in about 17 visits or something like that. Um, got a yeah, ter- I think it's one, one out of 15 or something like that. It's a terrible record and they... They, they don't even look like the Giants when they play there. I no. mean, when they play on spotless, so they play a lovely brand of footy, and uh, and they even at uh, what the old Eddie had marble, I think it's called. Um, they go all right there too, but they were they were just anemic. At, um, well, the Hawthorne, which is really Hawthorne's unusual. Hawthorne's been because... playing like shit, and Giants have been playing all right. There's no way you could tip the Hawks in that game, despite the MCG record, and yet you would have no. thought that the team swapped Guernseys before the start of play. Yeah, um, some of you know some of the big guns. You know, Canelio, who I really admire as a footballer, had uh, an average game by his standards. And you wonder how much the electricity that Whitfield generates just with his charging and uh, beautiful disposal, etc., how much he generates in the rest of the team. With his, and because in his absence, they haven't looked anywhere near as good. Yeah, it's a good observation, Mac. I, I reckon he is a bit of a spark for that team, but. Uh... Come on now, they're supposed to be right in the middle of a premiership window. They've been playing well. How they kick, you know, less than 40 points in a game of footy against Hawthorne, who have been just going and uh, not really looking good and, and rough head out and all that, all that sort of stuff. So not a good performance I reckon by the Giants. that's part of it. Well, I mean, that's part of it, though, because they dropped his favourite son, really. 
in Roughhead, mm. which basically put every other player on notice. I mean, if that could happen to him, holy crap, we want to stay in here. We have to pull it out. And we know that Clarko um, really gets his team up for those good teams. He, yeah, he seems to find a way. They, they like that challenge. Um, so I think there's, there's there's that little bit of that psychology from Hawthorne that's going on there. Well, I think dropping rough in was an advantage to because I reckon he's been, to put it very bluntly, he's been playing ship football. I mean, for, and really has for not only just this year, but last year as well. You know, they've given him a very, very good run on, on the, some of the rubbish that he's produced over that time. Well, they and probably I know felt been, obliged. Well, they probably yeah. did. Uh, but... You know, the young lad, I think it was is it Williams who was playing at full forward, the young lad that uh, took a few good marks. That, um, he, look, he looked a lot more likely to mark the ball and to score and to be in the right spot rather than uh, Roughhead has. And uh, I thought it actually made their forward line a lot more potent without Roughhead there. He picked five in the VFL and there's actually some great vision of him at coaching his opponent on the field, <laughs> which, which is the type of bloke he is. I, I can actually see he just seems to be somebody who's going to be a natural, possibly a development coach yeah, more than a, a head coach kind of thing. But um, I actually really like that from him. Yeah, well, I'm, sure he's, I'm sure he's a terrific bloke, Nicky. You know, and that, that was never in question. It's really just the, the football he was producing. And, yeah. and can we just pay homage to uh, uh, an ex-crow? Ricky Henderson, 125 yeah. uh, uh, footy uh, super coach. Dream points, team. Th- 36 disposals. Ten marks, zero tackles, of been... course. But uh... oh, did he yeah. have an opponent? No, look, he's he's uh, he's obviously given uh, given a mandate by Clarko uh, to get out on his own uh, because that's the one thing he can do. And I don't know who covers his opponent, but uh, he's been every year this year, every game this year, he's been played very very well. And uh, as we know, he's always been a very good user of the ball. So what Clarko is doing is, I said, give him a mandate to get out on his own. Well, he's and using his he, strengths, he, isn't he? Yeah, it is. And I, I think it's very good coaching, actually. Seven inside 50s and nearly 652 metres gained from Ricky. That's uh, Look, it's a credit to him because his career was just about dead when he went to Hawthorne, really. Um, and he was probably seen as depth uh, to the Hawks. And the fact that he's been able to forge a career uh, at the uh, at the Premier is a, is a really good uh, um, fillip for him. And uh, credit to Clarko, too, for recognising his strengths and utilising them. Uh, the last game, which is still going, although it's just about over, and bloody Fremantle, come on, come on. Uh, Richmond I look like they're passes. getting up. They're currently 25 points up. Uh, Richmond uh, up 111 to 86 with uh, only a minute or two to go, so it looks like the Targs are going to have a good away win over there. Well, as you did pick uh, Richmond on the basis that... Um how could you, how uh, you pick uh, Richmond? They've been playing like shit, and it's in Perth. Well, I, yeah. I, I just thought Frio, um, they, they really played a very dour game on the, uh, against us, and I thought if they play that against Richmond and Richmond, who do have a team of runners, if they get, if they do get through them in, on their on that oval, it's a pretty good sized oval. I thought that, that they would get on top of them, and, and it would appear that that is the case. Mm. Well, it would appear that that's the case, Macca. So you're a fucking genius. Um, no, I didn't. I got a lot wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the only one you uh, got right. <laughs> I got about, I got about four, I think. Four now I've got to mark the bloody cast explicit, so we might as well start swearing. Uh, g'day to everyone on Facebook, by the way, uh, particularly Bill, who's joining us from Launceston. If it's cold in Adelaide, imagine how cold it is in bloody Launceston at the moment. Jeez. You'd be used to it, though. Yeah, You'd probably, probably think that's warm weather for Launceston. <laughs> We'd be freezing. Yeah, probably. All right, well, look, that's enough of that. Let's get into some match talks, shall we? Well, there's two seconds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> like do you realise, week. though, that, this net, that these results, we're now third? Yes, we're well... We're finishing uh, the round actually, third. Actually, good point, Nikki. I should be doing this the bloody ladder before we get into... Uh, Get into ours. So let's quickly run through the ladder. We've got the Cats on top on 28. Collingwood uh, alone in second on 24. The Crows on in third now uh, with a healthy percentage above GWS and Brisbane and West Coast. Uh, Fremantle uh, look Richmond like... Richmond will go into six. 
Yeah, so that's what I was just about to say, Nick. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I've got the live ladder in front of me. Yeah, so have I. Richmond will uh, jump up over uh, over Frio. Um, uh, Hawthorne now also, uh, they'll just bump out of the eight. Uh, the Bulldogs and Port also on 16 points, and then uh, and St Kilda as well. Then we've got the Bombers, the Suns, and Melbourne on 12 points. Uh, Sydney and North on eight, and Pick one is on four points and looking good, Macca. They certainly are looking good. And I like the way they're playing. <laughs> no, pick one's looking good, mate. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about the way we're playing. I mean, you know, well, the pick one. But the, well, I don't know, but I, I think uh, they're going to win a few more than we really want them to. They're not playing no. a bad, bad brand of footy. No. Uh, but they're not going to finish very high. So if we don't get pick one, we'll certainly, we'll certainly be in the, uh, in the one to four range. Yeah, nah, it'll be one or two. I don't see them getting any higher than that. Yeah, well, that's, there's that's apparently boring. two very, very good lads and, um, and and people argue who's going to be the best out of those two lads. So, um, yeah, they're two slightly different midfielders. So yeah. you've got more the one who's the inside grunt and then you've got the outside with the explosive pace. And don't we want the one with the outside explosive pace? I think we do. <laughs> nah, it'll be all right. All right, so let's talk about the uh, fantastic showdown on the weekend, and it was the Crows getting up 13 goals, 10, 88. Uh, flattering Port in the end, getting up by 20 points. Port, 9 goals, 14, 68 after a six-goal last quarter. Um, and uh, look, my first impression, apart from anything else, is that we are playing a style of football that has still got some work to do, and I'm not getting ahead of myself, Macca, but... We are now playing a style of football that will stand up under pressure. We are, um, and there's no doubt it is. It's you know, um, uh, your sponsor said we're getting back to the way we were playing in 2017. Well, that really is not the case. Um, we are playing uh, a totally different brand of footy than we played in 2017. That was more based on moving the ball as fast as possible, getting over the back, and uh, getting goals that way and uh, high scoring. As you, you quite rightly brought to our attention a couple of weeks ago, um, and uh, Nicky was on it as well, and I, I was as well, but I'll just give credit where it's due because you had publicly <laughs> raised it. Um, <laughs> the fact was that uh, the way that we play now with the back line playing deeper and the midfield uh, in between uh, the centre line and the half back line um, and uh, the it makes it very, very hard to score against us. And that's really, even though the Port Adelaide had 60 uh, inside 50s and they kicked a lot of points, a lot of that was because of their pressure that was being put on them. And uh, so it's we what we're doing now is, is basically restricting a little bit like Fremantle, but not totally the way they played it. Um, we're trying to stop the team from scoring and then try to use the ball when we do get possession of it uh, to uh, get into our forward lines and uh, do something with it. So it's a totally different brand of football than what we were, what we were before because the emphasis on before was on attack. Now the, the emphasis is totally on defence. Nick, what do you got to say about all that? I actually agree that it, it is very much um, a style that will stand up to pressure, but it's because we bring it first and we literally are daring the other teams to handle that pressure and we know Port can't. Um, and so that's why I was actually going into this game quite confident and it wasn't because of their outs they had, et cetera, because we had outs as well that are just as comparable. I mean, they're not as recent as what theirs are, but we still have. But it's that in at the coalface, it's that absolute bullying and the fact that, you know, you've got Atkins who gets a falcon to the face and he just kind of like goes, oh, look what happened to me. And that's no, very un No, come on. You're not going to start saying that Atkins has turned into a tough little mongrel. He hasn't. Because he was just dazed, the Nicky. fact that he laughed about it. He was dazed, <laughs> yeah, for God's sake. Too. No. Look, I, <laughs> no, you just jumped the shark but, but I, th- <laughs> but I, I think it's the, that we... We know that we we were struggling, and Don actually said it um, in the aftermatch presser that 
there were certain things that he saw at that North game. He was like, okay, if we want to win, this is what we need to do. He then approached the leadership group, said, this is how I think we need to fix it. How do you think we need to fix it? They agreed with him and went, okay, we're going to implement those. We'll start bringing them more into the training, et cetera. Um, and we've seen what's happened. Well, finally, and I reckon I've been screaming for this for freaking two years, I reckon, we're finally playing a style of football that suits our squad. You know, yes. because this fast yeah, break footy that we've been playing uh, for a while, it, it looks great when it's working. Um, but it's so brittle that it just takes one little change in momentum or one little turnover and the whole thing falls apart. We're picking uh, blokes pretty much on form now, uh, which means that we're pretty heavy in the midfield. We've got some big bodies in there, a lot of inside grunt and all the rest of it. Um, we've got a few good outside runners and we're very solid down back. So we're finally playing a game style that takes advantages, advantage of our strengths and minimises the risk from our, our weaknesses. You know, as soon, I, I think I tweeted at the beginning of the last quarter, you know, if this game opens up, we're in trouble. And it did, partly because we're a bit fatigued and partly because, you know, Crouchy had been off and then Tars went off. But it did sh- it showed very clearly what a fast team can do to us if we if our structure falls down and with uh, Ryder getting on top in the ruck in, at the beginning of that last quarter and giving them first use it it exposed exactly what could happen if we persisted with playing fast free flowing uh, footy that didn't have much of a de- defensive mindset so I'm so relieved and I'm filled with so much confidence now that we're finally playing a game style that suits our squad, suits our players. It's not terribly difficult, like it's not complicated. It's it's focused on ground ball, it's focused on rebound and it's focused on hitting up up forward. And I love it. I love watching it. Yeah, because you you can what you're seeing is 100% effort from virtually uh every player on the ground. Um even Atkins, uh, and, I, and I'm not going to say he was rippling muscles like Superman or anything like Nicky was a <laughs> I um, wasn't. I was just saying it was very unlike him. But he, but I, I didn't see one moment that he actually squibbed the ball, which I thought was good. And I, I did see him compete for a couple of uh, vigorous balls where he got one big smack on the side of his head there for, for his efforts. But that was the ball that did that, I think. Um, but... Uh, I, I, I couldn't actually pick a player that never had 100% go on the weekend, Fiend. And once, you, once you're playing like that, and once you're in that defensive mindset that you're not going to let them beat you, you're not going to let them through, uh, I think, you know, and if, if everybody buys into that, you're a very hard team to beat. And as you say, that's the way you have to play to win a flag. And it's a little bit different. A, we, Sorry, Nick, go on. I was just going to say, we've got a great test coming up this weekend. Yeah, We've we got do. Brisbane. And, you know, we I, like to play that. I, I wouldn't mind betting we struggle next week. We've had two very tough games, and now we've got to travel up to uh, Queensland. Uh, it's going to be a big ask, but uh, anyway, we'll get to that later. But, you know, this we're, we're playing a lot of rebound footy, but it's not the same as 2017, is it? Because it's not... <sighs> We're playing, everyone's playing back a little bit deeper, aren't they, Macca and Nikki, in my opinion? Yeah. Uh, oh, there's no doubt about that. And we're not concerned, we're not concerned about necessarily going from half back to a score. We're concerned about going from half back or, or deeper to another stoppage, um, you know, forward of, forward of centre. So we're quite happy to, uh, you know, tra- take the possession chain if we can get it, but we're not throwing caution to the wind which means that we get burnt on the, on the way back and our forward 50 pressure is far better uh Lockie Murphy has contributed to that but I think all yeah, of our for, all of our forwards have contributed to that but also because the ball is moving a little bit slower as we do transition our our um our second line of defense is able to move up a little bit higher and we get we we had so many repeat inside 50s on uh yeah. on Saturday night um and that means that you know, we're controlling the play for long periods of time. And I think a part of that is there's a lot more um, belief in our current ruck and the midfield setup that we're willing to take that um, stoppage in on the centre wing. Whereas even though in 2017 we were playing some electrifying football, it was great to watch. 
we were invariably losing the ball when it was there because they weren't quite – we had to get the turnovers. That's the way we were doing it. Now we're still going for the turnovers and that pressure, but the way we're doing it is a lot more, I think, calculated. And it is, as you said, it is every player in the team really working towards it, but also being smart about it. Well, and one other thing that I've noticed just before we get into the stats, I've noticed that over the last couple of weeks, we've actually um, fallen behind on clearances. Even though we've maintained uh, good contested possession numbers, our clearance numbers have dropped off. And on the surface, you would think, oh, gee, that suggests that there's something wrong with the midfield. But when you actually look at it, and I didn't have time to put any footage together tonight, but when you actually have a look at it, the other thing that we're doing, which is a marked difference, is that we're not committing so many players to the ball at stoppages. Um, yeah. We are we are hanging out, uh, one or two maybe, uh, but we're not sort of all in, and we're really corralling uh, the congestion, and we're making we're putting a lot of pressure on the second and third possession coming out from the opposition, um, and I, that's very Hawthorne like. Hawthorne aren't. You would never think Hawthorne is a dominant uh, clearance team, and yet look at the success that they've had over time, and it's very similar to that. Um, the clearance numbers are another indication, in my opinion, uh, of the change in mindset and the change in game plan that we've that we've utilised now. Yeah, and interesting, PJ Crow's quite correctly he says uh, he's talking about uh, Rob O'Brien and Himmelberg have straightened us up and brought a, a point of difference. There's no doubt about it, Rob's. Um, uh, O'Brien, he's got the energy in the centre, he, and you know uh, Jacobs was barely getting off the ground. O'Brien's at least jumping to compete, and then still competing very hard once the ball hits the ground. Um, and Himmelberg, he's you know he's he's never going to kick a hundred goals or anything like that, but he's well, I don't know about that, right spot. I reckon well, he, he could once he starts well, collecting those marks and maybe not hundred goals. Kick in front of goal. No, Maybe but the point I'm trying to make is that he, he, he's certainly playing his role and he play, he's playing his role to perfection, in my opinion. He uh, he competes with the ball in the air. He tries to – he makes leads, but they're not in the same place that Walker is. Um, and that's one of the reasons why that, that four line is functioning as well as it is because um, I, I don't know whether they've got set places they lead to or set plays how they do it. But, um, the other forwards seem to understand it very well. And uh, that – and uh, – I've got another bloke that uh, Lynch is, was saying is so important too in the way we're playing. Well, let's not get to really... individuals yet, Macca. Let's just. All right. Well, I'll, I'll hold my fire just... on that one. Okay. How long have you been doing this cast? Uh... <laughs> you know the order that we do it in. <laughs> uh, well, I, the most important thing is not to do my. He forgets my every week, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's look at some head-to-head -head stats and. Uh, we kicked it a little bit more than Port, uh, although the disposals were relatively even. Uh, 377 to Port, 385 to Adelaide. Um, but our kick-to-handball ratio leaned more towards kicking marginally than uh, than Port Adelaide. Uh, probably uh, a good uh, adaptation to the conditions because despite my son telling me on the Rev Up show that it was going to be dry, um, it wasn't. Thanks, Cam. No, it um, wasn't, no. no. They outmarked us, 67 to 55. Uh, but uh, this next... Um, stat was one of the keys to our performance. 93 tackles to 78. Um, we hunted them and we chased them and we did not allow them any free ball apart from that 10-minute period in the last quarter. And uh, 93 tackles is an excellent stat. Um, hit out. Uh, Port won the stat 50 to 38. Uh, but I'm just having a look at the differentials here that I've got in my little... Thing because I don't reckon that hit out thing actually blew out too much until late. Uh, let me just have a look. Where are we? Hit outs. Uh, yeah, the differential really didn't blow out until towards the end. At the beginning of the third quarter, I think we were only minus four on hit outs, uh, and it didn't blow out until towards the end. It ended up sort of minus 12-ish or thereabouts. But So Riley O'Brien held his own for a long period of the game, um, and as I said, it really was only in that last quarter, and you could forgive him for fatiguing. I mean, yeah, the, you know, the kid, the kid uh, was jumping against two genuine ruckmen for the whole game, and uh, you know, Elliot uh, ended up about twenty percent in the ruck, I reckon. 
but kudos to Riley O'Brien for for really, apart from that ten minute period, really nullifying the impact that Lysa and Ryder had on the game. And it's an inter- an interesting point because the whole football industry, not just Crow supporters, but uh, all, all all the experts, always said. What's going to happen to the Crows when Jacobs goes down or if he goes down? Well, we found out. We found out we'll probably improve. Well, yeah, his I think second effort. Fantastic. Yeah, his second effort's great. Anyway, let's uh, proceed. Um, free kicks were relatively even. Um, our disposals per scoring shot, probably not really relevant on a wet night, but uh, still not too bad, 16 and a bit. Um we got smashed in clearances, uh, 53 to 36, as I mentioned. Uh, Clangers were fairly even. We had 10 more rebound 50s uh, than Port, but they had seven more inside 50s than us. So overall, we were more efficient. That was and, just pretty much the last quarter. Yeah, and just, you know, from, from the eye test, it looked like we were being more efficient with our forward entries. There was a period there where we were scoring from just about every forward entry, and Port was... You know, Port had a reasonable amount of the ball, but it just didn't look convincing to me. It, it There wasn't a lot of system in their play, um, and uh, they were quite inefficient up forward. Um, contested posies were pretty much line ball, 188 to us, 187 to them. Um, same with uncontested. Uh, disposal efficiency was about the same, around about the 65%, which you'd expect on a wet night. Um, contested marks were even marks inside 50 were pretty even really it comes down to intensity and uh, they turned it over a little bit more than us oh the other stat um, our, our defenders had 60 odd inset mark or inset possessions yeah. between them and, and overall we had 100 to uh, 95 uh, for the game um, all but, except for one of our defenders were actually had a better intercept um, possessions than the leading intercept possessions. So 8.5 is the average um, for McGovern, yep. the West Coast. And Kelly was the only one. He got seven. Everybody else was nine or above. Yeah, well, that's why Kelly needs to be dropped. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He's for being God's sarcastic. Sake. Yeah. Uh, Letty had 15, Keith had 12. But anyway, we'll get to the... Uh, yeah. So, I mean, look, there's not a lot to take out of uh, that head-to-head uh, stuff apart from the fact that I think our intensity was up and we're a little bit more efficient. Um, and some of the stats really point to the style of game that we wanted to play or that we brought. Well, there's no doubt about that. And, and um, the, the, the Nikki's point there about the uh, intercept marks is quite relevant because... It's us get back to that strength and defence situation uh, again. I thought our back line was quite remarkable in terms of the way they played because there was no particular weakness out there, um, whereas in Port Adelaide you could see weaknesses in their defence, um, which is why we were able to score as we did. Um, so I think, uh, you know, at, and at full strength, uh, maybe Kelly doesn't even get a, get a game at full strength. I don't know. Um, no, he comes on as the reliever for the um, so like for Brown, or one of the others go off. But um, uh, in our back line, I, I didn't see a weakness. Um, you know, my favourite whipping boy back there. He, he, you know, he played a reasonable game, um, Hardigan, uh, and the others I thought all played very good games. So um, I think that was our strength, main, our main strength, and uh, and then of course we had our on ballers dropping back there to help them and. Uh, particularly, um, uh, what's his name, Sloney, and uh, which I'm trying to think which Crouch probably was. I think it was Matt was back there early, and then Brad took over in that role of dropping back yeah, in towards Matt that half back line. Yep, and see why the number of times he helped in back in the back line was incredible. So, uh, and uh, I did post in the chat. You know, he was he was 99 percent on the scrap heap last at the end of last year. And thank well, only God according that one, to you. Yeah, I well, don't think he ever was. Well, uh, that I was think the, the, club, were the re- club were always keeping him. Well, that's good because the way they were reporting, I thought he was gone. And um, no, that was just and, <clears throat> people like you, Matt, that didn't have the faith. Anyway, let's get into. I didn't some, have the faith. Uh, no, you <laughs> didn't. just just on that back line though, silence back in the team, and he didn't take a backward step um, in Luke Brown. I think that's what gelled. That once they had him back there, they knew. 
whoever the small forward is, Luke's going to take care of that. We can then play. We've got our best back six there. And that I think that's efficiency. what. <laughs> oh, and because him taking the kickouts is so much better. And the other thing um, about that is, was I love that Jonathan Brown actually just piping up and going, he's the best small defender in the league. Yeah. He is. Brownie, Brownie makes some pretty good comments and often he's against the accepted wisdom, if you know what I mean. And uh, he's made a few observations about a couple of Crows players and is, is spot on about Luke Brown. Look, uh, Let's go through some individuals, uh, shall we? Now, Rory Laird had, uh, as I mentioned, 15 intercept possessions out of his total of 31 with 20 kicks and 11 handballs. Um, he apparently had a tagger. Well, yeah, yeah no, they, brought in, they brought in that young lad to tag <laughs> no, him. Johnson. I mean, yeah, Aiden well, Johnson. Johnson was, yeah, yeah. yeah, and, uh, yeah, that was as good as useless. Um, Laird, knocked up getting the ball, particularly in the first half. It was ridiculous. Eight inside 50s too for Laird, which... And that's an interesting stat because, uh, harking back to what I was saying earlier, uh, guys, about our secondary defence pushing up a little bit higher to get re- repeat inside 50s, I'd love to know how many of those inside 50s were actually secondary inside 50s because I reckon most of them would have been. Yeah. yeah. Um, Particularly in that third quarter. Yeah. Uh, six rebound 50s as well for Rory. 14 uh, contested possessions. Um, 674 metres gained. Uh, a little bit of Rory Laird of old, in my view. We haven't seen him be that uh, influential for a while. Best game of the year, I thought, um, particularly as he had an alleged tagger as well. Um, and, but the type of game it was, it was a very physical game and uh, most of it played, uh, played in uh, very close quarters and with the slippery ball. And I thought, yeah, he... Even if he'd won the medal uh, instead of uh, uh, Keith, I don't think anybody would have argued. There, there was probably about three or four of them that could have. But uh, no, Lenny, I think he had an outstanding game, as you say, right back to his best form. Yep. Um, Bradley Crouch, I'll be interested to hear what you think about his game. 10 kicks, 20 handballs for 30 touches, uh, six tackles, four inside 50s, uh, two rebound 50s, had 12 contested. Um, only two sixty-seven metres game, but six score involvements. Turned it over a little bit. Um, my my take on Brad's game was that he was very influential early, um, but even though he continued to get possessions, his his actual impact on the game sort of fell away a little bit as the game wore on. Yeah, well, Agreed. I think he, he he did take over Matt's role of dropping. Normally, he he does the uh, in front of forward work mostly. And uh, Matt does the behind the centre work, and he had to drop back and do Matt's role, which he's obviously not as familiar with as he is, is the normal role. But um, because that's where a lot of the time when he got the ball, he he handballed it off to another player rather than trying to kick it himself. Um, I still think he played a very good game, but uh, not yeah, as you say, not not quite as influential as, as normal. Yeah, he he just needs that little bit more hurt factor on his disposals um, because he's starting to really get that ball and he's and you, we can see that he's getting more confidence, but he's still got a bit of the dolly kick going on, um, and I we just need to see a bit more of that hurt factor, and he needs to look a bit more laterally. He's, you know, he's still focused immediately what's in front of him. You know that dolly kick. I was looking at him kicking, uh, and I reckon. I just wonder whether it was it's a bit of a carryover to his uh hamstring issues because the yeah. one thing the one thing you don't want to do when you've had bad hamstrings is extend your leg. Yeah. And Precisely. it seems to me that he pokes at it when he kicks it. Um he and, might be onto something there. Yeah. yeah, who knows? And probably psychological, but I wonder whether that's had an impact. But anyway. Um but look, he's getting enough of the ball. Uh I I agree with you, Nick. He just needs to be a little bit more decisive and aggressive with the disposal. Only 267 metres gained. So, um, you know, a good game, but probably the stats pad out a little bit. Sloaney, on the other hand, got full value for every one of his 26 touches. Uh, 15 kicks, 11 handballs, 3 marks. Uh, just 13 tackles, so it was pretty lazy. Uh, 9 inside 50s. <laughs> um, oh, just some of those touches he was doing. And they're not going to count as touches and... Um, yeah. But it was so influential of, no, you're not getting the ball out. Yeah, yeah. I thought his stats were outstanding in the end when you consider that he 
he only actually only had two possessions in the first quarter. Yeah. Uh, and but so that all the rest of these possessions, including his tackles, etc., mainly came after that in the three quarters. And again, most importantly, when Port were making that charge, Slunny was the guy that really stood up and helped uh, stop that charge and steady the ship. Um, and he, he he really is a genuine leader. That bloke. Well, I just want to mention too, for a bloke who just genuinely gut runs all day and and puts his body on the line all day. For him to spend eighty five percent time on ground is just a it's a testament to his uh his ethic um because he must be absolutely rooted by the end of every game eighty five percent time on ground playing the playing the way that he does uh is just a, a bit ridiculous um look he had uh, six score involvements five intercept positions gained his five twenty two meters would have been a worthy uh, showdown medal winner i reckon and scared the crap out of Motlop. yeah he he was one of the others well, I would have considered. <laughs> oh, we'll come True. back to Motlop in a minute. And uh, just on Sloan, uh, Sloan, uh, Laird, and Keith. They, they're the three that I was thinking that you could have tossed up out of those. Yeah, well, and Lynch. Yeah, Lynch too. Uh, and also, Lynch, t- yeah, and without Lynch. without get, getting ahead of ourselves again, Mackie, you really are not sticking to the script tonight. But I'm I reckon, a I really yeah, am. yeah. <laughs> I reckon Tali's game is underrated too, but we'll get to that. Uh, Alex Keith, the showdown medalist, 26 disposals, if you don't <coughs> mind, uh, five marks, two tackles, seven rebound, 50s, 14 contested possessions, uh, 12 intercept possessions, uh, just a, an outstanding game from Alex. And and this, this week was the first week where I really thought that uh, we were warranted having three tools down back. Uh, I felt like if their tools played to their potential that that could worry us. Uh, but the fact that Keith was able to take care of his bloke and still be able to run off his man uh, and intercept and dispose and distribute, uh, just a fantastic game from Keithy. It was yeah. really interesting that he was actually matched up on Westhoff to start off with. Yep. And it wasn't Talia and oh, it everybody was else was talking about. No, it was how great Talia was. Westhoff then kind of moved himself to make sure he was on Talia and he wasn't on Keith. Um, and so that freed up Keith then. I think that left, so that, was that left Keith on Marshall, I reckon. Yeah, and Marshall's – he's got some nice tricks and everything else, but he's not he's just quite a skinny kid. smart. He's yeah, a skinny and he's not kid, quite smart enough. Goodness sake. And Keith is yeah. too strong for him and he's got that reach and he does a nice clean spoil. That when he does, he he very rarely actually takes the arms um, as part of it, and so I think that really fell into our laps. And then they just they had nothing. They had to put Westhoff down back. It was like because he, he really wasn't giving them um, anything there. But I, I think that's that's quite, kind of what that little switch was. So even though he was then on Marshall and he's as you said a skinny kid, he was on Westhoff to start off with, and he absolutely towed him up. Yeah, I think it didn't matter who Keith was going to stand. He was just going to tail him up because he was, uh, he was, he's in top form at the moment. His judgment on the mark is outstanding. And if the ball hits the ground, he reads it as well as anybody else. Um, and his disposal is excellent. So um, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? You know, we lose Lever, along comes Dudo, and, and then Dudo gets in and along comes Keith. And um, I've got to say, uh, uh, the people that, Choose the players and develop the players. Do a very good job down yeah. the road. Um, look, I, Cam and I spoke on on the previous show about Port needing to make our uh, three back tools, particularly Alex Keith, accountable. And I just felt like at no stage did Hinkley try to isolate uh, Keith's opponent and make Alex accountable. Like the guy's t- absolutely tearing you to shreds off half back. Don't you try and play through his opponent to try and make him, you know. Uh, accountable to his opponent and a little bit less damaging going the other way. I didn't see any effort by Hinkley all night to try and correct that. Well, I don't think Hinkley's a very good coach. Um, and, I, you know, uh, Pike versus uh, Hinkley, I'm, I'm not, uh, what's his record now? 7-1. 7-1, is it? Seven one, is it? Yeah, and, uh, well, you know, I, I don't think Port Adelaide are going to be a threat to anybody as long as Hinkley stays there. I don't think uh, he he's a very good uh, tactics coach, and uh, and some of their players don't develop as they should. Yeah, I'd go along with that. 
All right, uh, Ellis Yeoman, uh, I reckon, uh, particularly in the him. first half, he's just Love so his, strong yeah. in the contest. And as I've mentioned before, it doesn't go to ground. And oh, people who have been bagging him, I hope they're reading their words because uh, me, or I think most of us on this uh, podcast have been Ellis Yeoman supporters. And, uh, you know, he's had a bit of a tough road at times, but he looks to be entrenched in the 22, and it's well-deserved in my opinion. 24 touches, yeah. seven tackles, six clearances, uh, four rebound 50s, backing up what you were saying, uh, Macker, about him getting behind the ball a bit. 15 contested posies. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, four intercept possessions. Uh, just And probably our, our main, him and Huey, probably our main clearance weapons now. Um, and uh, I, I, just, I just love the way he goes about it. He's unassuming. He's not pretty, uh, but he's so strong in close. He was one of the few players who felt, it, <coughs> when you're watching him, it felt like he had a dry ball in his hands, whereas everybody else was playing with a wet ball. Well, and that's he the thing, He was just Nick. so clean at being able to pick it up. And but, then he does those little side steps back to create his own space to make the right decision. And you hit on two things there. Sorry, Mark, I'll give you a run in a sec. But the thing that's annoyed me the most is this myth that Ellis Yolman fumbles and that he's got shit disposal because... He's actually very clean below his knees and yep. his disposal is more than passable, um, you know, in the context of the type of game that he plays. And uh, you're dead set right. He, he was as clean as a whistle on Saturday night. And, and, he was, and he was also doing similar things to what Sloaney was, that even if he couldn't get the possession, he's just putting that hand in and stopping Port getting a clean possession. He uses his body very well. That's the one point I was going to make. That's one of the reasons why he does get uh, get the ball a lot of times when you think he's not really in a position to get it because he does use that bulk of his. And uh, it, it, well, you know, I've seen the chat. He's been called a bull, and he does. He plays it like a bull. Um, see ball, get ball. And um, but he, it's not really aggressive, he, is it, Mac? It's just that's his size and just the way he plays. It's he, not he as uses if he's... It, he uses it well. Yeah, he just moves them off off the yeah, ball. Yeah. Um, Huey Greenwood, our other inside uh, player, 11 and 11 for 22, had a couple of marks, Lovely. including a nice little hanger that he messed up. Um, seven tackles as well, as Cam also had seven tackles, uh, eight clearances, uh, 19 contested posies. His disposal efficiency probably a little bit lower than he would have liked, uh, but seven stoppage clearances and uh, three intercept possessions. Getting, well, getting, yeah. getting back to him is uh, his uh, full form, I reckon, Huey. Yeah, one of the commentators made the brilliant observation is that I think the Crows look better with Greenwood in it. Well, I thought, <laughs> no, what shit, a brilliant observation. He's, I mean, we haven't lost a game since he'd returned, have we? Yeah, he's only best 22. <laughs> yeah, and they, they make it sound like he's a marginal player. Yeah, I know. But they, and, they were saying that me, about someone else last week too. And I actually thought that Huey didn't have that good a game. I oh, thought I he, he needed to, Well, no, he still, for him, the way the conditions were, I thought he should have done more. I just kind of felt he got a lot better in the second half, but it just seemed it, it just wasn't quite there in the, the first half as to how we know he can be. So whilst he's got all those great stats and it, Still says he had a good game and he's named him the best. I'm like, he could have done better. You're a hard driver, Nicky. Yeah, I don't know, Nick. I, you know, a game like that. Uh... He was he was fumbly early, and to me that was really unusual. <laughs> well, the ball was pretty wet. Yeah, I reckon everyone was thumb. Any, yeah, anyway, but, anyway. Yeah, but anyway. he's a Tasmanian boy. Um, what do we think of Rat? Twenty-one posies, seven marks, uh, three tackles. God. Three people fell into his arms. Uh, four inside fifties, uh, seven rebound fifties, uh, an amazing three contested possessions, um, four score involvements, a couple of intercepts, turned it over a little bit, uh, but did gain a six hundred and twenty-seven meters. I didn't actually mind Atkins' game, aside from one thing that he's still not giving the first possession. He still is looking to fend off and dance and skip around. Yep. And it just drives me freaking crazy. Every criticism. player in the league knows he's going to try and fend off and you can get him for holding the ball. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very valid criticism. But, but apart from that, um, 
uh, one of the one of the th things I get really uptight about is uh, when he squibs it. And I said uh, to Mrs. Mac after the game, you know, that I, I don't can't remember screaming at Atkins. You bloody squib once <laughs> for the whole game. So um, I didn't mean, particularly did from Macca. Well, you know, I I, I don't think he did, and uh, you know, um, but that silly dancing about it's the he wants to do little skips and turns and bobs. Which also messes up the forwards up forward. I mean, they're making yeah. leads as well. But and, he does uh, it in bad positions, Macca. That's the worst thing. Yeah. Like he got caught again. I reckon on a half back flank uh, in the first quarter. I think it was. And yeah. it's just he's got to be aware that in those sort of positions he's got to have a defensive mindset. Um, yeah. And if it is just bang it on your boot down the line, that's better than getting caught holding the ball on the fifty. So absolutely, yeah. you know, there's a time and place, and you know, we we loved Rat when he when he did burst onto the scene a little bit for his ability to sidestep, but the last last Saturday night's game was not a game where that was going to work, and you, it's not the kind of thing unless you're Jake Lever and have, and can sell fantastic candy and have got a bit of strength about you, um, it's just not the place to be doing it. No, I 100% agree. Anyway, uh, Tommy Lynch. Uh, welcome back, Tommy. Uh, 20 posies, 14 and 6. Uh, and he took two marks, which surprised me. I thought he took a few more than that. Uh, kicked three goals, though, which was great. Six tackles, uh, six inside 50s. Um, he had 12 contested possessions, which is a good return for Tom. Uh, seven score involvements, a uh, couple of intercepts and 460 metres uh, gained. I, I just feel like it might have taken Tom a little while to uh, find his spot with new structures and new rules and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, we've we definitely changed our game plan. And uh, he's still he's still the... Uh, the the, the linchpin. Yeah, the <laughs> linchpin, the connector, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but you're right, I think, Fee, that, you know, he's uh, uh, not... Right, you know, he's, he's moving, he is definitely moving to different places and... That's part of the way because the way we move the ball differently uh, from the back lines, and then the way that the forwards in Walker and uh, uh, what's his name um, Himmelberg, the way they, they they lead differently to different patterns. Because Jenkins used to hang around in the square all the time, so uh, I think Lynch is. I reckon he played a very very smart game. If you look at those stats that you've read out there, they're outstanding stats for a half forward flanker. Oh God, yeah. I mean, that's, it's almost unheard of for a halfback flanker. Um, you know, 20 touches on the half on the half forward flank. Um, but it wasn't just him getting the touches. He was quite damaging with them too, Mac. He was front and square quite often. Um, he put himself in really good positions. And I felt he was quite sure with ball in hand. So it was a really good return to form for Tommy Lynch, I reckon. He's sort of building nicely. Of yeah. Uh, D Mac, I thought was pretty good. Nineteen touches off uh, off the back flank, couple of marks, uh, three tackles, three inside fifties, uh, four rebound fifties, uh, seven contested, uh, gained us four hundred. Turn it over a little bit with six turnovers, but uh, probably all you can ask from David uh, in a game like that. Well, you know, I don't know. I haven't been on big footy for a while, but I don't know whether they're still uh, using him as a whipping boy, and it was a period he deserved to be. Um, but that period's gone now for a couple of seasons, and uh, I think you know he is he's got a light frame. He goes where angels uh, fear to tread, and he, and as you say, he, he he does gain ground. He he dashes through. He uh, kicks a goal or two. I, I just think that uh, his game was very very good, and I think that he's a, a permanent member of the side. I'd much rather they've been there than Gibbs the way that Gibbs has been playing. Well, the problem for D Mac is when Seisman's fit again. And and DMAC is doing everything right. Um, and and anybody who actually had him for first goal of the game, I think, made at least the lazy thousand dollars. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. I was thinking about that when he kicked. Oh. I thought, wow, that's a first goal. Bloody <laughs> Whoever Bonanza. had. Um, yeah, he's he's providing great run off the wing, and then it also means that. We can actually, because he's got good aerobic capacity, so it means we can then push him back on the half-back line to give Laird or Smithers a rest if they need. Mm. But he's he's mostly actually playing on the wing since he's been back um, and often a defensive wing role. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I thought he was good. Uh, now, Matty Crouch was only on the on the ground for thirty five percent of the game, but uh, still picked up a lazy nineteen touches, <laughs> <laughs> including five clearances in thirty five percent of the game, ten contested possessions. Uh, so even yeah. though he didn't play, he deserves a mention. Five score in- involvements in a quarter and a bit. Um, <laughs> he was on he was on track for some sort of game, and I reckon that's half the reason he was so pissed off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah pro rata, he would have got 50, I reckon. <laughs> well, the funniest thing is that you could kind of see that they had targeted him at the start of the game. Well, we're going to be really physical and we're going after Matt Crouch. And have they not understood that he loves that? That actually fires him up and gets him more involved in the game. And it just, it was the complete opposite. So them doing that and them actually talking about, oh, you're, we're bringing in Aiden Johnson to take lead and it's like, well, there's your two plans and they've backfired. What do you got now? <laughs> oh, can we send West off down back? Oh, bloody hell. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just a one-trick pony, Kenny, Kenny Hinkler. He really is. Um, he is. No idea. No idea. Well, the fact that yeah, they actually showed him in the box and he's sitting there, there is no notes in front of him. No. Uh, uh, well, and he doesn't seem to be having any interaction man. with No, he's with just sitting stuff. there. Anyway. Did you hear? Did you hear his post-match conference? No, but I can almost yeah. I can almost pick it, Maka. Did he say that they were brave, and that they weren't far off, and that they were battling with injuries, and you know, just one and, or two and things? And if they had kicked straight, it would have, could have could have been a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very predictable from Ken. Yeah, he was quite happy with his boys. Yeah, well, he shouldn't have been because they they stunk it up for three quarters, and and he stunk it up in the coach's box. I reckon. Anyway, uh, of the rest, uh, look, we've mentioned Luke Brown had 12, uh, 12 kicks, 18 possessions all up, uh, played really well with nine intercepts. Uh, Brody Smith also with nine intercepts uh, to go along with 17 touches and six rebound 50s for both of those blokes. Um, Daniel Talia's game I thought was really underrated. Uh, I, haven't yeah. seen, I haven't seen Tails look that free and be that um, proactive uh, in defence for quite a while. He had 13 touches, but five marks and probably about 2,837 spoils. Um, <laughs> three, three rebound 50s, uh, 11 one percenters, nine intercept uh, marks as well. Uh, it's the best game I've seen Tails. Yeah, the uh, best yeah. game I've seen Tails play for oh, two years, I reckon. Yeah, I said to Mrs. Macker, how do you be standing him and be so... Frustrating, you never get a bloody kick. He just punches away, punches away. And he's, he's, he's not worried whether he gets the ball. He just makes sure you don't get the ball. Yeah, and that's his role in the team in the back Absolutely, backlines. absolutely. Um, but so but he also is he's that captain of the back lines. And when he was off for those five minutes, they were a little lost. They couldn't kind of get it together. And it was him then coming back on the field. Sloaney still trying, and that just went that just really propelled us to get back in the game and, and kick those last um, couple of goals. Um, it, it's, I saw last week I thought he played quite well as well. Yeah, uh, it, it looked, uh, he looked like he was getting back on track. But, um, uh, no, I really rated his game on, uh, on Saturday night. Uh, look at the rest. I thought the Berg played his role really well. He he drew a crowd often when the ball was kicked in his direction. Um, he did, didn't he? And I felt like his second efforts at ground level were really good. Um, he only had the twelve touches, but uh, five tackles, uh, a couple of hitouts, ten contested posies, and uh, just he, he just gives a presence that I don't think Josh Jenkins has given us. And uh, I think your observation earlier on in the cast was was partly right, in my opinion, Mac. That he does, he straightens us up a, a lot, like Matty Robin used to. Um, mm. But I reckon, I reckon he's got a little bit more firepower when when uh, he gets a bit more confidence and a little bit more experience. Uh, it wasn't wasn't the night for overhead marks, but I tell you what, if he could have uh, jagged one or two more. He certainly made enough position. Yeah, you know. And I. But sorry, Nicky. But if we keep playing him, and we and we obviously will, uh, one of these games he's going to explode and really do it all in one game because it's there. It's got, you know all that ability is there. He's got the fire in the belly. He's got a little bit of shit in him. He's got all the things you would like in, in a player, 
Uh, and I reckon you know, one of these days you just got to put it all together and have a really big one. Yep, I agree. Uh, and you can, and you can see his away. influence as well with Tex because that um, where Tex did the double-handed tap down to Lynch. So if when you see the, the vision from behind, you can actually see as the ball's coming in, Lynch is already on the move to be in the perfect spot in the middle. And Tex has identified that. As he's going in, he's like, I'm not even going to attempt to mark this. He's, and he's just that like, tap down to him. And that was that, brilliant. That yeah. Was and that's brilliant. what we saw Himmelberg do the previous week. So I wonder whether that got highlighted quite a bit in the, the post match oh, review. Text does. Which yeah. you'd think it would. You've, but you've, Tex is a smart player. You've taken a very, very long bow to include Taylor Walker in a conversation about <laughs> Elliot Himmelberg. <laughs> Jesus. I, Just want, wait no, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring it up earlier about in the Lynch bit because I, I just really liked that bit of play. It just showed the smart play we've got going on down in yeah. that forward line. Well, yeah, Marty Manager points out that, sorry, that Himmelberg kicked two goals from holding the ball free kicks and uh, makes a comparison that JJ's never done that. I'm sure he hasn't. Well, um, I don't think JJ's kicked two goals when the stats say one goal one either. Elliot only hit, kicked one goal. He um, did. Because he, oh, well, he, he missed that. He missed that. He missed that sitter. Um, the Gooch uh, needs another run, I think. Uh, Lockie Murphy, uh, 11 tackles, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, that's what forward pressure is all about. Uh, the only thing I'll say about Lockie is that uh, his intensity is up really high. Um, but I think sometimes he just lacks an ounce of composure. So if he can maintain that intensity, but just um, just settle uh, at times when he's got ball in hand, I reckon that'll just about complete him as a small defensive forward. Yeah, you're never ever going to argue about his, inten- uh, his uh, intensity or the way he puts he put, really puts in. I mean, he's a brave little fella, just brave. He just tackles the biggest guys, and he gets a few whacks and belts from them as well. But uh, no, I love him. I, I think. He's, at times, I think he's looks like he's a little bit slow, but then all of a sudden he does. And he's not. That, no, and he does something which totally disproves that, Nicky. And uh, I think, yeah, no, look, he he's you know, he certainly make it very hard for the other little uh, other smalls in the playing in the SAFL to get you know, isn't he? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, he's keeping Jace Jones out at the moment. Uh, Eddie Betts, I thought, was around the place. I, I think. Uh, we're only going to get flashes of uh, five goal Eddie from now on, but he still just creates a present around the packs. He still uh, warrants attention, and the the trouble that uh, opponents have is if they kind of underestimate Eddie, he'll kick you. He'll kick a bag on you. So that in itself is still worth placing the side, in my opinion. Yeah, he yeah. creates panic, and he does. And they were concentrating so much on him. So that's why Murphy and Knights, et cetera, could get their, um, their kind of their, their chances. He was getting those little taps. They just weren't quite going his way, but they were close enough to it nearly happening. Did Riley um, Knight play? Yes, he did. <laughs> Two goals. <laughs> Uh, that's nasty, uh, well, No, I, I thought I, I was really disappointed in Nida's game. Um, but anyway, we'll get to that. He did kick two goals, which probably redeemed him. But uh, anyway, Riley O'Brien, uh, we've talked about him already. I thought he did uh, a, a fantastic job uh, against two He really changed. Because um, we know Lysette likes to bully and he jumps in. Um and he, he often looks at the Ruckman first. He does. And, yep, and he goes up with a knee up, which is why I loved it when Smith took him out. Like, how the hell did he get that free? Smith is entitled to protect himself going up. He didn't have the foot out dead straight. He had his knee bent up. You're allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but Riley then changed the way he was going for the taps, and he pretty much moved into where the ball was going to drop, and Lysette couldn't do that the way he normally does. And so they had to switch and they moved Ryder to play more against Rob and put Lysette up against Himmelberg. Very, well, which is a move they had to do because, uh, you know, of the two Ruckman, there's no doubt the Ryder is a better Ruckman because you can get up higher. Well, and the problem that Porter yeah. got, the problem that Porter got on that, Mac, is that they want to play Ryder at full forward. 
That is their problem. Yeah, and yet because... Lysette is is not the like. Ryder had thirty three hitouts to, to Lysette seventeen. You know, so your first ruckman's getting half the hitouts that your your you know quote unquote second ruckman's getting. They've got their structures all the way wrong at the moment. Anyway, well, they, and... that, Robert, uh, but in fairness uh, to O'Brien, he's the one that forced that by. Um, uh, he more than handled uh, Lysett, and I thought, in fact, I thought he was perhaps uh, winning against uh, Lysett, which is why they had to bring Ryder out in, into the ruck, um, and uh, this did start to give him a bit of an edge in the clearances because Ryder's he's got that leap that uh, he did. But Matt Crouch was actually reading Ryder's tap so much better than the Port mids. Yeah, then so we those did, first we ones. Did lose the clearances, though, Nikki. No, we lost it in the end, but we didn't in the first half. We were actually up in the first half. Anyway, look, I thought it was a good performance by Riley, um, and he's doing a fantastic job in uh, in Source's absence, and it'll be very interesting to see what happens when Source comes back into it. Uh, look, I've pretty much covered everyone because it was such a, a an even performance. Um, Just on Riley Knight, um, I think you did raise a good point, though, Feeney. While he got two, he always does something that sort of saves his skin. Like this week he's got two goals in a game where goals were hard to get. And, but he's only had the 10 touches for the game. I just wish Riley Knight would just put a whole game together, a complete game. I think I think Knighter has never broken out of that new kid in the team, 10, 10 touches is all right mode. You know, and I think that he needs to, like, he was on the ground for, you know, a good 80% of the game. And I just think he needs to, to do more. What he, I said to Cam the other day, you know, I, I like the things that he does, um, but mm-hmm. he just doesn't do enough of them. You know, only three one percenters for the night, um, three contested possessions. So I'm just struggling to see where his strength was. You know, uh, I, I just there, there's not one stat like you know we talked about Lockie Murphy only had eleven touches, but he had eleven tackles. So immediately yeah, yeah. you can see what he's bringing to the table. With, when I look at Riley Knight's stats, and this has been an ongoing thing with Knighter, I can't see the element of his game that he's bringing to the table that someone like a Chase Jones or a Ned McHenry or you know, even someone like Richard Douglas when, when he's fit again um, can bring to the table. And I think Knight, Riley's starting to... His, oh, I hate to say this, but his AFL career is starting to slip away in my opinion. I mean, he was there for... Um... We could put him on to tag if we needed, and he did that quite well. But the thing is we've been using Ellis Yolman in that role, particularly on the midfielders, and so we don't need Knight for that anymore. So what is his role um, so much in that forward line? And I agree, he needs to be getting at least 20 possessions. Um, well, and the thing is... And as Barty Magic said, his stats over his career, it's even. Yeah, that's, he, they haven't not, changed. There's no growth. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And, and what you said about um, Ellis Yolman is is topical because Riley Knight had twelve months there with Ellis Yolman out of the equation to actually make a mark on the team. You know, he and he also, I, from memory, he wasn't terribly injured during last season, was he? He played most of the games last year, from memory. I think he did. So you know, he he had the advantage of playing in teams that whilst we weren't playing well. He was getting a big opportunity to to make a name for himself in this team, and I just I think his opportunity is slipping through his fingers, and as pressure for spots becomes even tighter, with players coming back. I mean, you talk about Douglas and Seedsman and uh, Millera to come back Miller, into this yeah. team, uh, particularly the last two, Seedsman and Millera. But you know, and then and- you've got. McHenry, Jones, and Stengel and McAdam are building. That's exactly Senate. right. Not to mention Shaw and uh, Hamill. So there's uh, Riley's Riley's had three or four, three seasons or four seasons in the system now. And uh, as you rightly point out, and as I mentioned, his stats have been very even. He, he you get you get the same stats from Riley Knight every week, and nothing really stands out. And I love him as a player for what he does, but he just doesn't do it often enough. And I think I think I wouldn't be surprised if he has a rest this week. Well, you know, they might well be on the cards. And again, we've gone off script because uh, we should have left that to the wake-up award. But anyway, uh, let's quickly do our um, 
Jet of the Week and whatnot and uh, just run through a couple of that. We won't take too long on it, though. You're gonna get what you need. You're gonna get what you need. We can't really argue with Alex Keith, can we? No, no, heavy with Alex Keith. Yeah. yeah um, as we said earlier, there, there were a number of players because the, the type of game that we're playing and if we're winning, it means we're getting that even contribution across. But I, I think the way Keithy went about it, um, he was outstanding. Yeah. I agree with that. A case to be made for Sloney, a case to be made for Lynch, you know, a marginal case to be made for... Um, Letty. T- Letty, yeah. Did we have a breakout winner this week? I'm not sure that we really did. Maybe Alex the... Keith? Oh, <laughs> no, we can probably give it to Rob. Oh, yeah, because no, that's a fair call. A... Yeah, because whilst it wasn't a breakout, this was a hell of a test for him. And once again, he's taken that another step to say, I belong at this level unless I'm trying to kick it off the ground. Yeah, um, he should f- be banned from ever attempting to do that ever again. It's Poor little pigeon toad, Rob. Long way down. <laughs> it is. And and because that foot does turn in, I think he kind of forgets that it does. I was like, mm, that's, why, that's how, why you missed it. Um, and I actually, I would like to nominate Rob for it. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that too. Uh, and I think you probably all know who I think wins this one. Nighter for me. Yeah. Hey, what was it? I didn't hear it. And, uh, it's the, a wake up award. The... Uh... Oh, yeah. No, that's it. No argument. Yeah, I don't think he's got any. Uh, I don't think he's got anyone else at the moment. Even Rory Atkins probably did enough, but uh, yeah, Bob's Riley. Win it. Yeah, I think so. So all in all, just to wrap that up, uh, pretty solid. We head to Brisbane next week, uh, and I, I actually wouldn't be surprised if we dropped this game. Um, oh, I don't see why. Um, and I know, Brisbane, I, I thought they started the season off in outstanding fashion, but. There's just been a few chicks in their armour in the last two, three weeks. They're not playing anywhere near as well. Um, and I, I think we'll beat them. We I, do, I, about 23 points. Weirdly, we do play the Gabba really well. Except um, for that time, that one time when Neil Craig was coaching. Well, we've had some monstrous wins out there. No. And and the last couple of years we've we've played quite well. When they were building this type of that running style of game when it was still um, – kind of bothering us, et cetera. Um, but as PJ Crows has said, Brisbane don't like a hard contest that lasts. And as long as we can keep keep that up, but I'm with you a bit, Fane. I, I think this is one that we might possibly drop where all that travel and, and the lack of, because this is another six-day break. Oh, um, keep the faith. Keep the faith. For us. Yeah, I think the, um, the third six-day break in a row, um, but more importantly, the long trip, Mac, because it just eats into your training and recovery time a fair bit. Well, it does, it does. But you know, I, I heard one of the boys talking during the week, and that they said that as far as training goes, they're, they're doing bugger all. But it's all about recovery. And then they have one main session, which is again only a light session. So um, it's all about recovery, and that's uh, what's the key to running out this game against Port Adelaide. It'll be the same against Brisbane. You know, if we if the boys recover and get the Get themselves well, and then I see no reason why we wouldn't win. All right. Well, we'll see uh, how things shape up during the week. Obviously, uh, we don't have any injury report to uh, to talk about just yet, but uh, it didn't look like, apart from Crouchy with a mild hip court, which by all reports he'll be right for. I well, the, notice... the AFL thought we didn't have any injury, so. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, but, yeah, no, aside from that, I think it was all clear on the injury front. Yeah, that was the only one. All right, now, Nikki. Are we going to do the cockwomble here or are we going to wait for Tuesday? No, I think we're going to do it now. Okay. (laughs) 
What do you got for us? Well, Dane Rampy. <laughs> yes. not, only, not only did he <laughs> climb the post, which made me think of my nephew who's a little monkey, um, he also was caught talking to, um, arguing with an umpire early in the game and making the statement, you sound like a girl. Yeah, I know. That was a bit weird. Yeah, say not a good idea, honey. Um, so that that was a bit stupid. Um, then, of course, we had the idiotic decision to have Dwayne commentating the showdown. Oh, can he just? Oh, I think God, the, he just barracks his head off. The worst, the worst comment I've ever seen, uh, I've ever heard from him was when he said at one stage, "All the superheroes of Adelaide are here," and it's like, Dwayne, could you yeah, be, no. could you be any more embarrassing for God's sake? Just shut up. And and apparently, no introverts should play in the show. Do you actually do understand that introverts can play football? And, um, and apparently the booing for Tex was out of respect. Yeah. And also that Rosie's <laughs> going to be as good as Fife. And as soon as he said I think that, I like, Well, so, yeah, so therefore he's going to be a great player in a team that can't even make finals. I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, no. Who I, else? Uh, Gil's explanation about ticking off the uh, umpire doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> that oh, was always no, going to happen. Got no idea, Gil. <laughs> um, what else happens? Now, I don't like to burn one of our own, Nikki and Mackie. You know that. I'm very supportive oh, of, no. the, of, <laughs> of my talent. Go but for I, it. I'd like to put in a little Cockwomble number nation if I could, please. And I'm <laughs> I saying, think I might know who this is. Uh, Off you go. I, I'm saying it very quietly. I'd like to nominate Peter. <laughs> Peter? Yep. I'd like. You what? know what I'm going to say, don't you, Nick? I do. Yeah. I'd like to nominate Peter J. We love Peter J, a a stalwart of the Tuesday night show. Mm -hmm. Um, And we had the the good fortune of uh, interviewing Marty Matner uh, last week. And uh, I was doing the editing for it and all the rest of it. And uh, Peter, I think, asked the first or the second question. Yep, second one. I timed it. Peter J asked an 80-second question to Marty Matner, an 80-second question. Yeah, that's got to be, so that's gotta be some kept, sort of world record. Yeah, as I said, one of his shortest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he followed it up with a 30-second question as a follow-up. So at one stage, I was actually going to call it the Peter J interview um, featuring Marty Matner uh, rather than the Marty <laughs> Matner interview. But, Pete, we love you. You know I'm taking the piss. But uh, I just thought it was funny. It was like, oh, my God, is this question ever going <laughs> to – is it ever going to end? <laughs> well, I guess it, give it, we'll give him an honourable mention. Honourable mention. Yeah, the uh, yeah. the uh, yeah, we'll, Jared Whateley we'll get... Award for long-winded questioning. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But I, th- I think the cock gobble has to go to Dane Rampey. Just the human for the yeah, for the t- the two things that he did. I yeah. mean, seriously, what were you on on Friday night, dude? I have never seen a player uh, climb a goalpost before. Yeah, no. Uh, you just, I want to know what was going through his head. I just want to know what was going through his head. Not much. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Anyway, that's it for us. It's uh, another hour and a half. God, any attempt to, to uh, limit this show's time just falls by the wayside, so... <laughs> Uh, Bloody thanks. Nicky, done it again. Yeah, well, I can bl- blame having <laughs> Ryan on this time, so uh, that costs us five minutes. But speaking of Ryan, uh, we have to obviously say uh, a very big thank you to Smith Partners Real Estate and Down to Earth Electrical. Uh, also, Hardware Unboxed, which is Scorpus's YouTube channel. Go and check it out. He's actually uh, posted a really interesting review on uh, a 32-inch monitor the other day. He's very good on his monitor reviews. Um, and... Also, all our patrons now have been posting up our Patreon members uh, on the cast tonight, but I haven't updated the list. So for all the new patrons that have joined over the last week, you'll definitely get a shout-out now. Before we go, because we've got the stalwarts on, everyone who's usually on chat is on chat. On Tuesday night, a few new things are happening on Tuesday night. The first thing is that we're Uh going to be live streaming to YouTube as well as Facebook. For the first time. So in the past, we've live streamed to Facebook and then uploaded later to YouTube. Well, 
uh, from Tuesday night will be uploading to both simultaneously, uh, live streaming to both simultaneously. The second thing is, is that uh, in an effort to make Tuesday night as interactive as possible, we're going to be reopening the phone line. Now I've got it working again. Uh, so, and we will be trying to t please someone. The first person that calls in on Tuesday night with a legit call will win that Adelaide Crows cap that I've got. All right. So it'd be really great if we got someone calling in or a couple of people calling in. And the third thing, what was the third thing? Shit. <laughs> the third thing was actually the most important thing. <laughs> That's why you've forgotten it. Go down my path. I can't freaking remember. Uh, something else is happening too on Tuesday night. So um, I think the phoning in thing was it. Anyway, I can't remember. So anyway, get around us on Tuesday night. Uh, the format is changing just a little bit. We are live streaming, as I said, to two platforms now as well as audio only to Spreaker. Uh, oh, that's the other thing. One of you blokes that's that's a patron in the in the chat needs to come on as a guest. So I don't care who it is, but I'm going to be sending messages to you blokes uh, over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, part of the Patreon package is that you do get a guest spot on the Crowcast, and we're going to start doing that because, they, like, Nikki, what do you reckon? They all sit there in the chat, like as if they're experts or whatever. We're the ones putting <laughs> Precisely. out... Precisely. We're putting ourselves out, you know, we're putting our head on the chopping block. So it's now time for some of these blokes to actually join us uh, in the chat. So have a think about it. I Tuesday nominate... Night. I'm Tuesday nominating night. Vardy Magic because he's already brought in the, the Danny versus Carly. Yeah, well, yeah, I wasn't happy about that. Um, but, yeah, I, whoever it is, I'm going to be sending messages to all our patrons over the over the course of the next couple, couple of days. You don't have to be on for the whole show, just for 10 or 15 minutes or whatever. I can hook you up so that it's very easy to get on. Um, you know, there'll be no stitch-ups or anything like that. It's just a way for us to get you guys involved. And, you know, without the chat on Spreaker, it would be half the show that it, that it is. So uh, this is... Uh, uh, not only a way to get you uh, get you back for giving a shit on the chat, but also just to uh, repay the faith a little bit. So that's the three things on uh, Tuesday night. Maka, Nikki, thanks very much for joining us. Who, which of you two is on Tuesday night? Me. Um, Nikki. Nikki. So you're going to have to do sweets and smacks this week, oh, Nikki. Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks to everyone listening. Uh, thanks for all your support as usual, and we'll see you on Tuesday night for Tuesday Night Live. Good night. Good night.